I'm really excited about um, just the opportunity to preach God's Word. And this morning, I want us to turn to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. And um, it is clearly the great jewel of all the teachings of Christ. Would you agree with that? It is amazing. Some even go so far as to say it's the key to the whole Bible. Um, because it's almost as though Christ opens the, the sum, summation of all the Old Testament and then ties it to the New Testament moving forward. So it's just an incredible, incredible sermon. But there's not any question at all that the sermon itself emphasizes the call to holy lives or the idea of living righteously. Um, and, and what Christ is doing is raising the standard flag, if you will, of God. Now think about that. Christ, see, the, the people had been hearing from the, from the religious leaders about God. And Jesus Christ now takes those same people and begins to address them. And he takes the, the whole idea of what God's desire is and raises the flag, raises the bar, if you will, uh, to a whole different standard. And, um, you got to ask yourself, why would we need uh, this standard to be raised? And it's because the religious leaders had begun to put man's, not begun, they had attached man's rules, man's ways, and it become something that was sub-God standard that they were requiring the people to follow. And so, um, so what we see, and this is what I've titled this, is His Standard, Our Call. And the whole Sermon on the Mount is uh, related to this. But uh, certainly in the very first 12 or so verses, maybe 14, it is incredible to see how Jesus starts it off, uh, the sermon. And uh, But let's take a look at the very first, uh, verse 1 and 2. It says, seeing the crowds, this is, uh, I'm sorry, um, seeing the crowds, he went on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Now, here, this is certainly uh, more of a, just than the 12 disciples. It's more than just the 12 disciples here. He's talking about people that were following him and the crowds that were following him. And they all kind of gathered around as he got up on the mountain a little ways, and he began to teach so his voice would carry and all could hear it. And he begins to do that. But I want you to notice what, what it says here. It says, Jesus had seen the people. Sees the people. You know, seeing the crowds. Notice that statement because it's really, really an important thing. Because it's a perception that Jesus sees. It's, it's way more than just I visually see you. He perceived what their need was all about. He perceived the spiritual condition and he wants to now sit and clear up all the spiritual confusion and all of the, 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 the things that have been seeded into their hearts. And he wants to start clearing that up with truth. Truth from on high. Truth from the heavenly. Truth from God the Father Himself. And I believe he just had such a compassionate heart you know, throughout the Word of God, Jesus had a compassion for the people because they're God's people. And He has this compassion. He has this love. And He has this... It was the leadership of those people that He had so much struggle with, I meaning struggle in a sense that He would call them out and say, you guys are nothing more than a group of whitewashed tombs. That's about as strong as you can get. But here toward the people, he has compassion on their spiritual need and he wants to get the truth into their mind and into their heart. And I believe with all my heart, this is an example exactly how we should live our lives. We must see people in light of their spiritual need with compassion. This is the call. This is a standard. We follow the example of Christ. Christ looked. He saw upon the, He looked at the crowd. He realized their spiritual condition and where they were. And He steps right up on the mountain a little ways and they're, they're gathering in. He begins to see exactly what to preach and teach and He does it 
clearly. It is not ambiguous. It is not difficult. It is straight up. Here it is. Bam. Truth after truth after truth after truth after truth. No sugar coating. No, no, got to pour molasses on it. It's not like a waffle that you got to add all sorts of sugar and honey and molasses and jelly and everything else in order to get the thing down. Hey, Jesus says, here is the truth. Where are the voices today that stand and say, here is the truth? It seems as though we got to spin it all into something positive. I, I, I'm all about positive. Jesus was all about positive. I, I am excited to know that I'm going to rule and reign with Him forever and ever and ever. That's a very positive statement. But I'm also, God is angry at sin every day. Where are the voices that, that will take the Word of God and just speak it clearly and truthfully? Where do they, where are they? The voices of fire that will literally let what the people need to hear come forward. Well, Jesus didn't shrink from that at all. And I, I, I think that we got to quit worrying so much about what can we get and look more at the spiritual needs of people and start addressing it with great compassion for them. Why? Because some of them may be dying and going to hell. We don't even talk about that anymore hardly in churches. You know, the idea that we see lost people go by every day and never, ever say anything, that is on us. What's wrong with us? We have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And some are dying and going to hell. Why won't we open our mouths with compassion and say Christ is the answer in some way? I also think it's interesting that he just gets up on the mountain and starts teaching truth. Now, now get this: no smoke, no mirrors, no any kind of. Uh, oh, we got to have some real gotcha bring you in with the uh, food and all that stuff. I mean, none of that stuff was used. He just went up on the mountain and started preaching truth. No light shows. He just uses the instruction and, and exhortation approach. It's certainly not just trying to give information. He's trying to use what I believe is godly truth with an exhortation for you to live it. In other words, here's the standard. This is a call for you to action. So if, if this Sermon on the Mount is the standard and it also is the call for our action, it means it demands life change. You with me? Can someone say, Amen? It demands, see, when we hear the standard of the Word of God and an exhortation that says, it is our call, the only right response to that is to say, I shall implement that call. That's the only right response. It has to be that. And this whole Sermon on the Mount points to how we're to live our lives. So the Beatitudes are the foundation. And many uh, writers say the, the, the Beatitudes are the foundation for the rest. In other words, it's the launching pad for everything else in the Sermon on the Mount. So as we read through this, it sets these cornerstones. It sets these the, the, the landing pad. It sets the foundation. Whatever word you want to use in the English language, it begins to establish it. And then from there, the rest of the sermon launches. He raises that standard flag of God for us to live by. And the only question is, will we do it? <laughs> That's the only question left. Is will we do it? Will we receive it as our call of the church of the living God and will we do it? Amen. So let's begin with the very first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now I'm going to start with a few words that need to be defined and, and just kind of talk about them just a touch. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a feel. And in some versions, you'll see happy are the poor in spirit. 
And of course, we know that blessed means happy. Now, it's not like happy in a sense that you buy a happy meal at McDonald's. It's not, that's not the happy we're talking about. It's not like happy because you won $47 on the lottery ticket. It's not that kind of happy. We have to be careful how, especially in the English language, how we equate the words in meaning. This is just so important. The word happy right here is not in any of that type of a happenstance or environment that changes so it's pleasing to you and you're happy about it or the luck or chance or anything like that. It's happy in the sense of the highest form of happiness, joy, and blessing that a person can have. That's what we're talking about. I mean, it's where you soar into the heavenlies of happiness and joyfulness because of what you've just had a revelation about. Then it says poor in spirit. Now, the idea of poor is the idea to cower and to cringe like a beggar. Ooh, ooh, I don't like that, do you? Now listen, to cower and cringe like a beggar. And then he says poor in spirit. Spirit, it, this connects the poor to the spiritual aspects of our life. The idea of taking the idea of poor meaning the utter destruction which humble uh, takes us to a humble state where we have to petition someone else for our very existence. Now think about that. That's poor. That's what we're talking about. Spirit is, for an example, over in San Juan, Puerto Rico right now, the people over there are poor. They're in need of aid in order to survive. There's no way they're going to make it if, if we don't get of electricity going and water going, uh, food, water there. It's not going to happen. Do you get this? Their lives are in, at risk and in danger. That's the same idea of poor right here. So if we take the spiritual aspect that connects it to uh, uh, the idea of poor, it's the poverty in the spiritual area. So if we say poor in spirit, it is the recognition that spiritually, get this, I am utterly destitute apart from God, apart from Christ. I have nothing. I am nothing, can do nothing, and have need of all things through Christ. It is the complete absence of pride, self-assurance, and self-reliance completely. It's non-existent because I have no pride. I have no self-existence. I must totally, 100%, depend on my God to survive. It's rare that I hear people even address it that way. Now, Brother Bob, when he was living, he used to say this all the time. He'd say, I am nothing and Jesus is everything. What's he trying to say? He said, in and of myself, I'm nothing. But in Christ, he's my sustainer. He's everything to me. He's, he takes care of everything I have. He... he he provides in every way for me. He even sent the Holy Spirit to be with me. Now think about that. So let me give you a couple of illustrations of what I think in the Bible it would be illustration of poor in spirit. I want you to get the depth of this idea. First of all, the Pharisee and the tax collector. I want to read to you uh, from Luke 18. Uh, it says, Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, um, extort unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, Lord. I give tithes of all that I get, Lord. But the tax collector, standing far off, could not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus says, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. See, the tax collector was, a, was very conscious of his wickedness, of his own sinfulness. He was literally a, a great example of what it means to be poor of spirit. He was standing afar off. He wouldn't lift his eyes unto heaven. He was beating his chest, asking God to be merciful to him as a sinner. He understood his position. He understood where he was. And he displays both the idea of poverty of spirit and the action one takes when they realize this and it grips their heart. And you say, well, but I've, I've been saved by Jesus. And no, 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 no. Hold up. We're talking about something Christ is teaching, a very specific moment here, and it's a truth from the living God. And we have to realize that without Christ, we have nothing. We are nothing. We can be nothing. See, the Pharisee was complete opposite. He was so proud of spirit. He says, oh, oh, oh. he wasn't poor of spirit at all. He said, I thank you that I'm not like other sinners, especially like that tax collector over there. Man, the pride just drips off of that statement, doesn't it? See, this Pharisee will never know the idea of blessed, happy. Blessed are, blessed, blessed are they. See? He won't experience that part. He won't understand it at all. Now, let me give you a couple other examples I won't spend the same amount of time on. But other examples, for an example, Isaiah was poor in spirit after, after now, he's the high priest going into the Holy of Holies. He walks into the Holy of Holies and he says, I saw the Lord. He says, whoa, but when he saw the Lord, you know what else he said right behind that? He says, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King the Lord of hosts. You see, when we recognize, as we see God, as we realize what God has done for us, it should remind us of where we were. And we say, even today, I am sinful. Even today, I have done things and said things and thought things that should not be if I am in walking in His way totally. So therefore, He says, woe is me. I'm undone. Now this is Isaiah. He's already sacrificed. He's gone through all the cleansing of who he is before he goes into the Holy of Holies. And he still says, Woe is me. I'm undone. Another uh, example would be Job. Um, he's in the middle of a confession and repentance and he says, now, this is after he's gone through everything. We're in the last chapter of Job. Now, get this. He says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, listen, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, this is a man that was considered to be righteous among men that sacrificed and and, and lived for God and trusted God. Gideon, another man, he was called to be the deliverer of Israel. And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Now listen, behold, my clan is the weakest uh, in the um, Manzara, and I'm the least in my father's house. Listen to what he's saying. He's saying, I'm just not, I, I, I know who I am, and I'm not able, capable, nor do I have what it takes to be a deliverer. Peter says here when he, they're out fishing, and they come back, and Jesus said, well, cast your nets, uh, push back out and cast your nets, and, and the, the boat was filled with fish. Instead of Peter going, Oh my gosh, everybody get the fish in here. Come on, come on, come on. 
Here's what Peter says. He falls at the feet of Jesus and he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? I'm sorry, wrong one. And when Peter, Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. See, who are we to think so highly of ourselves when the examples we find in the Word of God, when the revelation of God comes to our hearts? Who are we to be able to say, I'm, I'm good, Lord. I'm, I'm so much better than everybody else. How arrogant. See, it is only through our Lord Jesus Christ that I am blessed. I am Happy beyond happy. I am in the heavenlies. I soar there because of Him. Not anything because of me. So the question that remains here is how do I become poor in spirit? <laughs> we don't run around beating ourselves up. I don't think that's the idea. But if being poor in spirit is a good thing, makes me blessed, then I should desire that, right? Amen? If it makes me blessed of God, shouldn't I desire to be poor in spirit? We need to know how to see this standard that Jesus is raising up, how to live it out in our lives. And you will never become poor in spirit by looking at others and saying, I'm just going to do what they're doing. That's not the idea. You can't, you can't uh, take on an example of somebody else and say, that's what I'm going to just do. I'm just going to do that. Because poor in spirit is a heart issue. It's something within. Now let me try to take you to where I want to go with that. First of all, by comparing yourself to others, I just want to say this. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves without understanding. Don't do it. Just because somebody else is poor in spirit by their action, I mean, that you see the action, that doesn't mean that's the exact same action as what you're going to, it's going to take for you. But let me tell you how you go after poor in spirit. It's simple. It's very simple. And it happens in every one of the examples I gave you just a minute ago. It happens in every one. Now listen. Focus on the revelation of the Lord. Because at any true revelation of the Lord, it should that's a blessing. Come on, is that a blessing? And it should motivate us to pour in spirit saying, Woe is me, O oh God, because the overwhelming, amazing revelation that I hadn't thought of, I didn't come up with, it was spiritual in nature that came to me because our God is compassionate toward us. I didn't deserve it. I, I, I want to. You just go, Lord. I want the revelation of God. Bam! There it is. It's. We should fall to our knees and say, Oh God, how you chose to give me that I know not of. I am not worthy. I'm not this. I'm not this. But praise be to your name that you would choose me to reveal yourself to me. See, that's poor of spirit. It's saying I recognize revelation is I recognize something I could not have recognized. Do you realize that? Revelation is all spiritual. It has nothing to do with yourself. It has nothing to do with what you look like. It has nothing to do with how great you are. It is God's choice to reveal to you. Isaiah saw the Lord. He said, woe is me, I'm undone. God came to Gideon and said, you're the chosen one. Whoa, I don't even know how to do all this. God sh showed up in a fiery bush to Moses. Moses said, I can't do that. You know, I mean, realize poor in spirit recognizes who I am versus the revelation of God that is standing before me. And I guarantee you, if we are in tune with who He is and in tune with the sinfulness of who we are, we will fall on our face saying, Oh God, forgive me. Help me to be what you're showing me. We won't be arrogant saying, No problem, God, I got this. Don't worry about it. You go on and go fishing or something. I got it. No. You don't got nothing unless He gives it. You don't got nothing 
Unless he gives it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. See, when we get under the infinite brightness of His revelation, you're going to cry out to Him being poor in spirit because the brightness of His revelation, every imperfection that we have will be revealed. You realize that? That's what, that's what Isaiah is saying. Isaiah is saying. He'd gone through all the forgiveness and all the things that he had to do, the sacrifices, the cleansing of his hands and his feet, uh, in order to even go into the Holy of Holies. Then he saw the Lord, which is exactly what he wanted to do. And then he falls in his face and he says, woe is me, I'm done, done. Why? Because he realizes the ritual is not what God is after. He's after the heart. And if the heart is tainted in any way, he could die. Oh, if we had the fear of the Lord in that way, the reverence, the holy reverence of our God to such a degree that we seek, we focus, we, we desire the revelation of the Lord and when it comes, we fall on our face and we say, Oh God, cleanse me, O oh God, that I might be used of you in the right way. You know, do you get up in the morning saying, God, show me a divine revelation. You know, I love His name. It's the self-existent, pre-existent God who seeks to reveal Himself, Jehovah. <laughs> God's not afraid of the prayer. Lord, reveal Yourself to me today. He's not afraid of that prayer. He desires that prayer. We're the one that falls short in desiring the revelation of God. Because we are totally arrogant. We are prideful. We think we have arrived. No one would say it in this room today. But we go on about our business like, like revelation is unimportant to us. Yet it should be sought every day. Lord, bring the burning bush to me. <laughs> Lord, I want to see you today. <laughs> Use me as a deliverer. Lord, inspire revival around the world through me. Let me see that revelation. Here's the deal. You've got to put yourself in position to receive revelation. Happenstance is rare with revelation, meaning that you're just going along and you're not praying for it, you're not seeking for it, you're not living your life for it, the Spirit's not leading you, you're just moving along and then... Somebody says, well, I just need God to speak to me. Well, let me just tell you clearly. Get yourself in position for God to speak to you. Seek Him. Literally, pray. Seek the Lord. Read the living God's Word. Put yourself in position that revelation will come. Be in church every week. Unless you're on vacation. I mean, you know, meaning I can't be here when I'm on vacation. But my point is, is be in Him. You are positioning yourself for the revelation of the Most High God. Do you realize the staggering thought of that? The one that spoke the universe into being, the world into being, the sun, the stars, hung them all He desires to reveal Himself to you. Revelation from God Almighty. Let me tell you something. It will make you happy. Oh, I hadn't even mentioned this. What's our reward? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> See, for those who operate in this poor spirit, your reward is the kingdom of heaven. Think about it. Just think about that. The eternal kingdom is gained by being 
poor in spirit. Now, this is not a popular message this morning in the church of the living God today. But we need to understand is here. Under, If you're in your Bible, just mark is. What does that mean? Now. That's what it means, Mr. Engineer. Great. In other words, let me say it this way. For those who operate in the poor of spirit, they shall have, shall have the kingdom of God today. Our kingdom of heaven, I'm sorry. Today. So therefore, it's going to create a happiness and a joy that's unspeakable. You can't explain it. You get all fired up and you're jumping up and down going, Woo, baby, this is good. Or you do whatever you do when you get excited and pull the door, you know. And it's it's more than you do for the touchdown for the for the I forgot the um the name of our team. What is it? Is anybody watching football anymore? I didn't really forget. I just wanted. To, I don't know. Okay, now if and this is a present tense, so that means that we're talking in terms of. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's a reward that is instant. Right now, bam! Isn't that awesome? If you believe the sentence structure of the Word of God, is is an important word. In fact, one man said, depends on how you define is. See, words matter. Come on, somebody say words matter. And God's Word really matters. See? For theirs is. In other words, it, it, it's right now and then it's a continuing reality that is on and on and on and on and is a reward that will last forever and ever and ever. Bam! How does it get any better than that? And I don't believe that there's any greater honor than to obtain the kingdom of heaven. The only question is, where are you? Are you getting up every day focused on His daily revelation? I have I struggle with making that first and foremost because I have a lot of things I have to schedule and do and be involved with and calm people down from and do this and do that. I mean, it's it's insane how busy some of my days can be. And yet God is desiring me to be focused on his daily revelation in my life. That's the call, that's the standard. Do your actions reveal a poor in spirit person? In conversations with other people, are you expressing your total 100% dependence on God, on Christ? When somebody says, man, I'm so glad the market is up 2,000 points, do you say something like, well, I guess that's a good thing. The best thing is is that I'm going to be up with Christ forever. Bam. Bam. There is no coming down. And there's no market collapse with Jesus. It's just, it's it's a whole mindset difference. Listen. Seek to become poor in spirit. Put yourself in position for His revelation, for your reward is the kingdom of heaven. This is, this is a message from Jesus. Early in the ministry, He, he, he saw the people literally seeing the crowds the very first statement out of his mouth was not I hope I don't want to offend anybody I'm going to try to keep everything positive 
<laughs> now, now, see, what does he say? The very first standard that comes out of his mouth is blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall. They, uh, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now think about that. The very first statement. It wasn't, I know you guys are doing a great job. I appreciate you doing that great job for God. The, the leadership's a little bit weird, but, you know, you guys are good. No problem. Right? So that's the way <laughs> some people spin it. Here's the truth. We are sinful and, and weak. And fall to the same temptations over and over and over again. And without Christ, we have nothing. Let us seek the revelation of God. Let us respond with the realization that it's all of Him. Not me.